I don't know of many programs that make full use in an open way of all the communication formats out there. We have, obviously, our wonderful terrestrial radio affiliates that make this program possible. We're also on XM and Sirius. Uh, we use Facebook and Twitter and My, MySpace. And, of course, we have the wonderful Mark Levin Show website that's absolutely free. And I know a lot of people download the podcast from there or they listen on the Internet or a lot of people... Um, you know, listen on a variety of formats, and we appreciate all of it. That's our goal, to to communicate with as many people as we can and in every way that we can. And we thank all of you for being here. Mr. Producer, I don't mean to put you on the spot. That clip where Obama just said that we, we shouldn't denigrate public workers and so forth, do you have that clip handy there? I believe it's five. five. Would you play that again, please? Go right ahead. I don't think it does anybody any good when public employees are denigrated or vilified, or their rights are infringed upon. Now, we need to attract the best and the brightest to public service. These times demand it. We're not going to attract the best teachers for our kids, for example, if they only make a fraction of what other professionals make. All right, let's We're stop gonna... right there. You see? You see my point? Another bought-and-paid-for politician, like so many of them. Now, let me ask you a question. He's talking about showing respect for public Employees, public employees. How about public officials? Should we show respect to them? Tell me, has the president shown respect to the judiciary? Has the president shown respect to the Supreme Court when he smeared that court two states of the Union ago? How about his lawlessness when it comes to Judge Vincent in Pensacola, Florida, where he is defying that court's ruling? Is that the kind of respect that this president wants us to show people in public office, or in public positions? Or how about his administration being held in contempt by another federal judge in New Orleans? Is that the kind of respect, the kind of dignity the president wants us to show other people? I mean, who does this guy think he's kidding? Did Bill Ayers show respect to the American people? Or that stupid-looking wife of his? Did they? Yes or no? Did Jeremiah Wright conduct himself with civility? No, he didn't denigrate anybody, did he? Him and his buddy Farrakhan, and both their buddies, Gaddafi. Right. Right, Mr. President. We'll follow your lead, your selective moral outrage, your selective preachings. Now, I'm going to ask this question because I think it's crucial, and I asked it the first hour. When is the president going to speak out? Tell Mr. Trumpka and all the bosses out there to cool it with the rhetoric and the threats and the pushing around reporters. When is he going to do that? He's not going to do that. And the media are not going to ask him to do it. It doesn't fit the propaganda. The propaganda is, when violence occurs, to blame conservatives. When violence occurs, search homes and cars for copies of my book, or Rush, or Sean, or this one, or Beck, or whatever. Try to create, try to concoct a scenario where you can destroy your opponents. Here we have people pushing around newsmen, pushing around cameramen, um, some of the female, <coughs> excuse me, Republican members in one of the state legislatures said that they were being sexually intimidated and harassed as they went to the assembly floor to cast votes. We hear nothing from the president. Not a word about civility. Nothing. Why is that? Uh, gee, I wonder what. We are dealing with a corrupt mentality, a corrupt ideology, and people who corrupt through and through. I don't mean financially. I'm talking about between their ears. And they do have a, uh, a tyrannical mentality. It absolutely is. Do you not believe if they could silence us right now, they would? Of course they would. If they could pull the plug on this broadcast right now and get away with it, don't you think they would? And not just me, others too. If they could control the Internet and certain bloggers they don't like, certain websites they don't, don't you think they'd do it? I don't think there's any question. Well, that ought to scare the hell out of everybody. Look at these thugs. Pretty damn scary. The president lectures you and me. <laughs> now, Scott Walker, the governor of Wisconsin, makes an excellent point. It's worth emphasizing. When all is said and done, if his reforms go through, public sector workers, that is, teachers and others, will have more collective bargaining rights than over a million federal employees. Why isn't Jesse Jerkson marching in Washington against his friend Barack Obama? Or Al not so sharpton. 
Or Trumpka, that slob. Why isn't he in the White House demanding the same thing? Why aren't they marching on Washington against the Senate and the House, demanding the same collective bargaining rights that state workers in Wisconsin will have when Scott Walker's done? Because Obama and Reid and Pelosi are bought and paid for. They'll give them what they want legislatively. They don't have to do it through collective bargaining. They'll do it administratively. Look at the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board. Look at the TSA, what's going on over there in terms of uh, union status. Look at the Labor Department's bought and paid for under this president. They don't have to go through the front door. They go through every back door and every window they need to. But I do have to laugh. 20, 25,000 people show up, many of them lying about their health status in order to get paid while they're not at work. Let me ask you a question. If we, and I'm not going to, this is simply hypothetical. If we were to call a massive movement rally, all the big guys and gals on talk radio, on the Internet, all the conservative organizations, all the taxpayer organizations, do you think we get twenty-five or 30,000 people? We could get 2 million people. We did it. In fact, we got tens of millions of people there. It's called the November election, and we're going to do it again. And we're going to do it again and again and again because we have no choice but to be active. How many times can they poke us in the eye before we act? How many times can they abuse our children in their future before we act? We don't do this because we want to. We do this because we have to. All right, now, I was talking about Libya earlier. Does anybody know exactly what our policy is there? I have no idea. Gaddafi has to go, and he has to go now. The president issued a statement. Oh, my God. I'm sure Gaddafi's sitting there with his translator reading everything that Obama puts out. The person who is leading the effort against Libya right now is the Prime Minister of England and the President of France. Two people. Even the EU is doing more than our President. And no, I don't see Libya the same as I see Egypt. I'm sorry, just call me discerning. But the President made a blanket statement not too long ago. He said, we will support universal rights everywhere. Well, I want to bring something to his attention. That would be in Red China, the most populous nation on the face of the earth, where there are not universal rights practiced. And I want to know what he's going to do about it, since that's what he said. Here's the New York Slimes. The call to action shot across mobile phones and Internet chat sites, urging people to converge on 13 Chinese cities to demand an end to corruption, inflation, and the strictures of authoritarian rule. The Chinese people do not have the patience to wait any longer, said one message. Two months of upheaval in the Middle East have cast doubt on the staying power of all authoritarian governments. But in China, calls for change are so far being met with political controls wielded by authorities who, even during a period of rising prosperity and national pride, have not taken their staying power for granted. The nearly instantaneous development of the police to prevent even notional, that's, that's their word, gatherings in big cities, the past two weeks are just one example of what Chinese officials call Stability maintenance. <laughs> a raft of policies and practices refined after color revolutions abroad and at home. Tens of thousands of demonstrations by workers and peasants. Ethnic unrest and the spread of uh, mobile communications and broadband networking. Chinese officials charged with ensuring security, lavishly financed and permitted to operate above the law, have remained perpetually on edge, employing state-of-the-art surveillance technologically sophisticated censorship, new crime-fighting tools, as well as provocative efforts to resolve labor and land disputes, all to prevent any organizer sustain resistance to single-party rule. It's a comprehensive call to arms for the entire bureaucracy to promote social stability, said Mary Scott Tanner, a China security analyst. The crackdown has been the most severe we've seen in years, said Wang Sanglian, a researcher of Chinese human rights defenders. So we have a major crackdown going on in Red China shortly after our president had a wonderful State of the Union dinner for him. I understand there was 2,900 calories a meal, by the way. Um, so what are we going to do about it? I mean, they're violating universal rights, Mr. President. Are you going to issue another statement? Are you going to ask for the leader of China to leave immediately? What are you going to do? Or are you, as I suspect, full of crap? We'll be right back. Well, actress Jane Russell just passed away, according to Reuters. Um, she was 89 years old. That's all I know. 
So we wish her family all the best. Actress Jane Russell. I do think this is an important point with respect to Scott Walker in Wisconsin. I think he's on to something here. And I think it is a fascinating point that when his reforms are passed, and I'm fairly convinced they're going to be, that state workers in Wisconsin, teachers in Wisconsin, will have more collective bargaining rights than the vast majority of federal workers. And then we have Obama lecturing, indirectly, Scott Walker. And as for liberals being for the little guy, they drive up our property tax, they drive up our food prices, they drive up our energy prices, they bankrupt our governments at different levels, they steal money out of these entitlements, quote-unquote, to pay for even more program. How is it, maybe one of you liberals can call me and tell me, other than your emotional appeals, how exactly is it that you're for the little guy? What is it that you do for the little guy that is so crucial and so important and that shows us that you really care about them? This is a serious series of questions. And while I'm at it, I'll go back to the Mark Levin question that he asks all the time, all during his seven and a half years of broadcasting. And when do we know, the question is, that we've accomplished your goals? How do we know? Because you never tell us how we're supposed to know. We'll be right back. Okie doke. I'm taking a lot of calls. Let's take a few. Diane, Santa Barbara, the great KVTA, go. Hey, Mark. You are the great one. Thank you. Um, you know, I find it a little bit disturbing that um, it just seems like the White House and Obama are being, are being led by, or, or the um, foreign affairs are being led, guided by the media. And, you know, it seems like they don't respond until, you know, like we had the interview, ABC had the interview with Gaddafi. Uh, you, you make an interesting point. I, I think Obama's foreign policy, like everything else, is driven by his PR. He doesn't want to be too out fr- far in front of this in case something goes awry. Um, the man, uh, when it comes to foreign policy, he's not an American leader. He's one of the weakest, most timid, incompetent that I've seen as President of the United States in dealing with foreign policy. I don't think he even likes dealing with it unless he's traveling somewhere, uh, staying at a really cool hotel, being treated like a king, and attacking his own country. That stuff's easy. But when it comes to actually dealing with all the, you know, the trouble that's out there, uh, I think he finds it too much of a burden. That seems to be the image. Yep. All right, my friend. God bless us. Staying on the West Coast, Brett, Los Angeles, California, the great KABC. Go. Hey, Mark. Good to talk to you. Um, I agreed with you about what you said about Obama being diabolical, but I was wondering if you thought that a president that has such contempt for America could actually be um, that cunning to go ahead and portray himself as soft on foreign policy or not doing anything to let us into a, a position where we would be attacked as a country and have uh, in some way to go ahead and have him usurp like totalitarian power. No, 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 no. I think, I think you're going too far there. No, I think he is, as you see. He's bumbling and fumbling, and, um, you know, th- it's hard work. Foreign policy is hard work, and you got to be paying a lot of attention to it, and presidents get much more involved in it in many ways than they, than they expect to be. And what's happening is the Middle East is getting away from us, quote-unquote, or so to speak, and we're not players. Now, keep in mind, I didn't think we should intervene in Egypt because uh, I don't believe in participating in overthrowing allies. On the other hand, Libya has been a longtime enemy. Uh, Gaddafi has had Americans murdered, including on uh, an airliner, and he needs to go. He needs to be taken down, and I feel we should be a, a little more active in that effort. All right, my friend, thank you for your call.